I remember thinking to myself, right, okay, is there any more that this day can throw at us? While we're on this call out and we're, we're treating this person and, and thinking about taking back to shore, we can start to hear a, another call out develop in the background. And and as we're listening and, and, and just kind of hearing what's going on, it, it starts to escalate to the point where we realise hmm, now we need to actually think about getting underway quite quickly uh, and going and helping them too. There's two up there. Initially, the radio chatter was was about people cut off from Birnbeck. Hearing about it develop in the early stages, maybe initially we thought this was going to be quite straightforward to us. But there was one particular moment I remember the message coming from the Coast Guard over the radio and you could hear the worry, you could hear the panic in their voice. As, as soon as we spotted the people in the water, it was, it was obvious that they were separated. We could see that there was a, a fair distance between them and it was clear that they were already caught in the tidal race. And I remember thinking to myself, right, we've really got to be quick here. And then as we got on scene and, and we could see the look on these people's faces, but I remember thinking to myself, right, we've got to get the one who looks worst first. As a, as a lifeboat crew, you, you, you tend to rescue and help people quite often, but being there at the moment where somebody is, is really desperate for your services, really desperate for the lifeboat to be there, you know, that's relatively uncommon. And, and when, we, when we managed to retrieve this lady into the lifeboat, and actually for a good time after that, until we made it back to shore, I, you know, the panic was, was obvious, the fear um, in the voice. So then we, we get the, uh, the gentleman on board and so, you know, as a lifeboat crew, we're starting to think about casualty care and how to help these people and get back to shore as quickly as possible. And then as, as news of a, a fifth person came in, uh, automatically you're thinking, right, okay, so we're now going into a search pattern for, a, for another drowning person. Again, this person was clearly in peril and um, we clearly need to get to them quickly. I think this, this particular call out showed the extremes of, of, of everyday life. And um, you know, it gives you an appreciation really for for just how how different things can turn out. You know, for different people at any at any point. For me, call outs to Burnback Island have a very um, serious uh, side to them. Uh, we've seen in this call out, we saw that people were lucky and we were able to survive them. But unfortunately, in my time, I've, I've been um, on two occasions to incidents there where we we haven't been able to find people. And on one occasion, actually. When we launched the lifeboat, we were able to hear them, but we, we weren't able to find them. We have a campaign in the RNLI at the moment, which is Float to Live. And I think if ever we can, we can just help people to understand the message, which is if you go into the water and you don't expect it, just float on your back, relax, get your breath back, and then, and then think of a plan. It's something I go through with my children. You know, I, I just try and teach them. I'm not focused so much on my two-year-old being able to swim at the moment. I'm, I'm focused on them being able to float.